Hey there, brothers and sisters. The church today needs to rediscover the true person and work of the Holy Spirit. Much of the problem is the modern church has lost sight of the Holy Spirit's true work and character. Many treat the Holy Spirit as an impersonal force or energy, and many portray him simply as a peaceful dove on a Bible cover or bumper sticker. Listen to this quote from A.W. Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy. Quote, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. So today I want to look at five different aspects of the true work and person of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers of sin. John 16, 8 through 11 says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. As the gospel goes forth through the preaching of the message of salvation, Unbelievers in the world are confronted with the reality of their sin and the consequences of their unbelief. For those who reject the gospel, the Holy Spirit's work of conviction might be like that of a prosecuting attorney. He convicts them in the sense that they are guilty before God and eternally condemned. For those whom the Spirit draws to the Savior, his convicting work is one of convincing as he pricks their consciences. As one commentator puts it, the world masquerades as righteous and suppresses any evidence to the contrary, and such behavior requires the spirit to expose its guilt. By ripping back the facade of self-righteousness, the spirit exposes the true condition of those who have fallen short of God's perfect requirements. Then, he turns their eyes to consider the unfailing righteousness of Jesus Christ. Number two, the Holy Spirit regenerates hearts. Titus 3, 4 through 7 says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So the Spirit's work of regeneration gives the sinner a new heart, one in which he is capable of genuine love for God and obedience to Christ. John 14, 15 through 18 says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, this Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. The fruit of that transformation will be evidenced in a changed life, manifest in the fruits of the Spirit, such as love, joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Regeneration is a transformation of a person's heart as the believer is given new life, cleansed, and set apart from sin. 
those who formerly operated in the flesh now operate in the Spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit enables fellowship with God. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Paul explains that God the Father rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Through the spirit of adoption, we have received the immense privilege of becoming part of the family of God. The spirit frees us from the fear and dread that a sinner would naturally have when approaching a holy God. Like little children, we can eagerly run into the presence of the Almighty and call Him our Father. Number four, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Romans 8, 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. The Spirit of God makes his home in the life of every person who trusts in Jesus Christ. Life in Christ is different because the Spirit of God is now within. He is there to empower, equip for ministry, and minister through the gifts he has given us. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and helper. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Genuine believers, people in whom the Holy Spirit has taken up residence, think, talk, and act differently. They are no longer characterized by a love for the world. Instead, they love the things of God. That transformation is evidence of the Spirit's power at work in the lives of those whom He indwells. In number five, the Holy Spirit seals salvation forever. Ephesians 1, 13-14 says, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. The sealing to which Paul alludes here involved an official mark of identification placed on a letter, contract, or other official document. The seal was usually made by placing hot wax on the document and then impressing it with a signet ring. As a result, the seal officially represented the authority of the person to whom the signet belonged. A Roman seal conveyed authenticity, security, ownership, and authority. And the Spirit of God represents these same realities in the lives of his children. Romans 8 verse 11, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. In the day of resurrection, the Holy Spirit will raise believers from the dead, giving them new glorified bodies that will dwell forever on the new earth. So in conclusion, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, Ephesians 5:18 says, "Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation, 
but be filled with the Spirit. In contrast to drunkenness, which manifests itself in irrational and out-of-control behavior, those who are Spirit-filled consciously submit themselves to His influence. When we consider the New Testament epistles, where believers are given instruction for church life, we find that being filled with the Spirit is demonstrated not through ecstatic experiences, but through the manifestation of spiritual fruit. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We are filled with the Holy Spirit when we are filled with the Word of God. As we align our thinking with biblical teaching, applying its truth to our daily lives, we come increasingly under the Spirit's control. God bless in Maranatha.